Vicki, the relationship with Gladys is something that means a great deal to you, does it not? It's, it's very important to me. Tell me about your relationship. Tell me about loving someone. Uh, before I had met Gladys, a mutual friend had told me all about her and was um, building her up and building her up and I was really anxious to meet her and just prior to meeting her he told me that she was HIV positive. I said, whoa, no, not that, not that. Um, and then we met. At first I was really scared because she was HIV positive and wanted to run in the other direction. And then I found that I couldn't and um, I saw a lot of courage in Gladys and a lot of strength that I admired and I felt that if I'd have ran from a relationship with her that I would have lost a lot. And, you know, um, it's, it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah, but it was I more damned stay in, if I ran. More damned if you ran. More damned if I ran. I don't want part of this. I don't want to be part of it. I lose my love or I stay with my love and my love loses their life. Right. That's Hobson's choice. Gladys, how and when did you find out you were HIV positive? I found out in 1992. Um, I got sick, I got really sick, and I went through a lot of um, respiratory problems. And um, the doctor said, well, let's try the HIV test. And since I had been tested before, I was like, well, okay, let's do it. And it um, came back positive, came back positive. Do you know how you contacted AIDS? Yeah, through heterosexual contact. Who, do you know? Yes. You don't have to tell me the person's name, but you were in love with a guy. No. Or you were sleeping um, with a guy. Or yeah, I was sleeping was with a guy because um, I had a bad relationship with a woman, and I figured, well, you know, time to change course, I guess. And um, he was HIV positive and didn't tell me anything. He didn't tell you? No. And that's how you got AIDS? And that's how I contracted AIDS. Vicki, you're in, when you met her, you were in a serious relationship with another person? Yes, I was. Are you, are you two living together now? No, I'm still in a relationship with the other person. Um, but you just told me you were in love with her, Gladys. It's, it's, it's a real conflict, and um, the person that I live with knows about Gladys, and when it came to the forefront, um, a lot of real uncomfortable things happened for all three of us. Um, the woman I live with is a therapist, um, where Gladys goes and uh, educates the clients on AIDS awareness, and uh, the woman I live with went to Gladys's job and told the director where Gladys works um, how bad and what a murderer Gladys is by being with me because Gladys knows she has AIDS and she shouldn't be with anyone at all. She should just be in a box in a corner and, and not seen and not heard. And um, Why are you alone. holding, if you're in love with Gladys, why are you holding on to the relationship with the other woman? You know, I knew that question was going to be asked me before I came on the show. <laughs> and um, I can take it back. I won't ask you anything that you don't want to be asked. Because it's real difficult. Um, I know why. I know why I think you're doing that. Well, I think you're afraid she's going to die and you're going to be alone. That's a real legitimate fear because Gladys is going to die, and it could be six months. It could be six. <laughs> Why write the book? Well, I wanted to, um, I, I was diagnosed with HIV in 1988, uh, early in 1988. And, um, and then a year after I was being, uh, I, I had blackmail threats um, from an, an abusive spouse. And so the thought that ran in my mind was the truth shall set you free. And so. Who was trying to blackmail you? Um, you, don't get, you don't have to give me a name. The person you call Tom? Tom in the book. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, that was kind of a running theme, but, you know, I, I really, I understand now that I wasn't ready for it, and so it, it was a, a process, you know, to, you know, to be ready for it, to be able to talk about it. And I also wanted to be here and healthy, you know, and, and be able to talk about it. Instead of having instead people of having, talking about you. Yeah, and instead of like going to you know the hospital and worrying about the tabloids and what they're gonna, you know, what they're gonna say. What were the young years like? You had trouble in school because you you didn't do well. <laughs> I didn't do well in school, but you yeah. were you dyslexic? Well, what happened was when I started school, I stuttered, and so I was in speech therapy. Um, had a very difficult time reading, but we didn't. I I wasn't diagnosed as being dyslexic until I was given, you know, my freshman college English class. I was given dyslexia as a vocabulary word, 
in my freshman English college course. And I, I recognize that and I go, oh my god, I'm not retarded, that I, I'm dyslexic. I was teased a lot. Um, my skin was darker than most of the kids that I was attending school with. And That's because so, your biological father was Samoan. Was Samoan, yeah. And um, I, you know, I wasn't too bright, and uh, I was involved in sissy sports. <laughs> you know, it wasn't you know baseball or basketball or football. Um, you know, I was in acrobatics and gymnastics and then diving. Tell me about your father. It was with, with my dad. I mean, it was it was it was a hard road, you know, in the beginning. Um, but I mean, that's one thing that I'm so proud of that we were able to come full circle and make peace with each other. Um, when he was diagnosed with cancer, I came out to him about my HIV status. You and told so, him that you were HIV yes. positive. Yeah, and so it became a crusade for life and quality of life. And so uh, we really you know, battled together. And that's what really drew us, drew us together. When you were a child, what did you think of your father? He drank. Probably one of the first times you're publicly speaking out about your life with Greg. What was he like as a child? <laughs> <laughs> did you know this was a very talent? Did you always know? Mothers sometimes say, I had not a clue that this was a very talented young man or young no, woman. No, uh, I didn't realize he would go as far as he did. But he was a year and a half old, and he was doing acrobats with his diapers on. <laughs> That's what happens. Mom. <laughs> it's a great image, Greg, having your mother yeah, on. Diapers and everything. Well. <laughs> was he moody? Was he yes. Moody? He was moody. Moody, shy. Mm -hmm. Greg writes that he tried to commit suicide on several occasions as a young teenager. Did you know he was in such pain? I knew he was in pain. I did not know that he tried suicide. Did you know why he was in pain? No, I knew that um, he was quiet, he was moody, uh, I couldn't reach him. Uh, no one could reach him and talk to him. When did you begin to think, or how did you begin to think that he might be gay? Well, I knew he was different when he was four or five years old. In what way? Because of his personality. He, he did not associate with people, right? He was yeah. a loner. And uh, I knew he was different then, but I didn't think of gay because I didn't know anyone that was gay at the time. When did you think about gay? Oh, I guess he was about 14, 15. Something like that. Did somebody tell you? Or did no, you? no. Just a mother's accumulation mm -hmm. of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Later, as time went on, did you know about Tom? He, no. I did not like Tom. <laughs> 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 we did not get along, but I didn't know about the rape. Or how bad it was. Or how bad it was, no. Well, I, I had told my mom before the book came out that, um, that uh, Tom had raped me. Um, after she had read the book, then she didn't realize, you know, what, which her, her interpretation of it was that he wanted sex and I didn't, and he didn't stop. She didn't realize how brutal it was. No, I didn't. I know what it's like as a mother to see a child in pain. What have these past few months been like for you? Wonderful. He's come out. I have come out. I can tell people. <laughs> Guys, six years of age. When Allie was diagnosed, she was, by the way, one of the first women in the heterosexual community to speak out. And her story literally became front page news. Uh, and a movie. How did the publicity affect the family? Well, our, our lives were changed forever from that moment on. Um, Hear that, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> uh, going public, of course, um, gave us responsibility. We felt it was very important to do this because up until that time, uh, heterosexual transmission of AIDS 
was more or less unheard of, unspoken of. And of course, when we went public, I got many, many phone calls and letters saying we thought we were the only ones. Uh, it, it was very widespread, but people hadn't come forward. And it, it kind of changed the face of AIDS to know that it was not just minority groups, gay, intravenous drugs, et cetera. It or was them, anyone. whoever. Or them. them. Those other guys, yes. It, uh, and of course, AIDS was something we never thought about at all until it hit us. And um, I think that's the problem even today, that too many people think that it can't happen to them, that it has nothing to do with them. And it isn't until, sadly enough, it does affect their family or their loved ones or people who... Suddenly, I just didn't feel so sorry for myself. Um, tell me about Marnie. How did she come to be diagnosed with AIDS? She just wasn't feeling well. And she wound up in the hospital, and they sent her home with pneumonia. And then she went back again. And they said, Marnie, we think that you have PCP pneumonia. I wasn't in New York at the time. I was in Florida with my mother, who was dying. And my husband called me and said, I mean, they think that Marnie has AIDS. And I said, don't be ridiculous, Neil. Girls don't get AIDS. It was 1989, March of 1989. And I read the Times every day. And there, there was nothing that indicated to me that that was so, and I felt that it was impossible. When I got to New York the next day, and they confirmed that it was, in fact, AIDS, I said, well, I have to become empowered now and learn everything there is to learn about AIDS, because we have to save her. I lost one child. Nobody loses two children. How did she get AIDS? She slept with um, a childhood sweetheart. Eileen, like Carol, you do a lot of work trying to educate America's young people and their parents about the disease. You brought some, what, have you, what did you bring with you today? Well, I got involved. I just totally got involved as, a, as an educator, as an advocate. And fortunately for me, there was a group that was just starting called Mother's Voices. Uh, they are um, a wonderful group of people from across the country who are advocating the government to put a stop to this disease. Marnie passed on, did she not, from yes. AIDS? Yes. She wrote this. Could you read it to us? Yes, I can. And then, then I will read you about Mother's Voices. Marnie went to CW Post and felt when she was homesick, she finally got sick in, in 19, at the beginning of 1991, that she would um, write something and read it to the students at CW Post to tell them that everyone is at risk. So she, in her way, was becoming an advocate as well. And she wrote, uh, which she never delivered because she died before she had a chance to. So I've been delivering it for her. Hello, my name is Marnie Mitzman. Nine years ago, I was one of you. Today, I have AIDS. I'm not sure how I got it, only that I've never been an IV drug user. For all I know, I could have contracted this virus right here at school. It wasn't until 1989, when I was hospitalized with PCP pneumonia, that we discovered that I carry this virus. I was always very popular. I always had at least one boyfriend and many friends. I had it all, or so I thought. Now I have it all. I even thought how much more together I was than so many. I mean, I was on the pill, so who needed condoms? AIDS was in the headlines then. They said, use a condom. But how could I, a young woman in college, ever come in contact with AIDS? <clears throat> that was supposedly for homosexuals and IV drug users. I was neither. I was safe. But I was wrong, dead wrong. <sighs> There's one more paragraph. I was sitting there with you nine years ago. Now I have AIDS. How many of you are going to say that? It's up to you. Stay with us. Well, um, Alex and I got married uh, July the 24th of 1991. And uh, we tested before we got married. My test came back negative, and his blood clotted in the shipping process, and his test came back inconclusive. 
So we just went on with the marriage, and um, two months later, I found out that I was just pregnant, and he had just tested, and we went to get his results, and he was positive. When he died, you could carry him? Yes. I can't, I, uh, well, there's, there's always that fear of rejection, and he didn't know how to deal with it. Um, so he didn't tell uh, everybody that he was positive until the very end. And um, They're on that platform the other day when I went to breakfast. She's executive director of the HIV Law Project. You, what I heard you say is, I want to say out loud the names of some women. Who were those women? Say those names out loud now for me, can you? I'm just going to say their first names, but Tamar, Sandra, Katrina, Lydia, um, Brenda. Who are they? Those are five very different women, all of whom were came to my office because they actually needed a lawyer to get what they needed from the system, to get Medicaid, to make sure that they could take care of their kids, to get benefits so that they could eat, so that their kids could eat. These were women that had incredible senses of humor, who were courageous, who were leaders, who were in their own communities teaching other women that they, in fact, could be at risk for AIDS. Um, they were the, some of the greatest people I've ever known, and um, all of them have died, but all of them touched thousands of lives. And I was saying their names because it seems as though somehow